and we are live. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this week, we are reflecting on evangelism and hospitality and what that looks like online. Um, we've asked our friend, the Reverend Greg Seiler from the Diocese of Washington to join us for this conversation. Uh, glad that you're here, Greg. Uh, my name is Jason Evans. I'm the missioner for missional communities. Stephanie, who are you? I am Stephanie Towns. I'm a missioner for congregational vitality. And this is Alexander, my cat, who decided to be in the picture too. Hi, Alexander. And Ellie, who are you? I'm Ellie Singer. I'm the social media and multimedia specialist. Awesome. So uh, folks, uh, Greg recently wrote a great piece on vital practices, and we'll get into that shortly. We'll make available a link to that article and other notes and links from this conversation at Epicenter dot org slash virtual dash church epicenter.org slash virtual church but first uh, why don't we start with prayer all right jason will you share your screen for us i would be more than happy to do that all right the collect for this week the lord be with you and also with you. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And a reading from Acts. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the needs to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah. So we thought we would do the same thing as we did last week and just start off with some celebration. And what I wanted to name this week as a celebration is uh, the work that our campus missioners are doing across the diocese. Um, if you were at diocesan council back in February, you got to see some of the amazing leaders that we have across the diocese. That was just uh, some of the people that are doing awesome stuff. And if you subscribe to any of their uh, weekly or periodic uh, newsletters, you see that they are doing some awesome stuff that has been inspired and led uh, by the students. Um, they have uh, recognized that they're not going to need all of their their budgets. And so some of them have decided to uh, leverage those uh, resources rather than meeting their needs as a worshiping community and instead uh, taking care of others around them. And that has just been super, super cool to watch happen. So uh, grateful for, for those um, those communities and what they're doing. And I'm sure we'll see some more about that in our diocesan communications in the coming weeks. Um, but first we just, we wanna uh, move forward in this conversation and reflecting on what we're learning in this COVID-19 crisis and doing church online and what the world looks like now with stay at home orders. And as I mentioned before, uh, Greg wrote a great article on vital practices. And so uh, Greg, Thank you for doing this. Thanks for coming on to talk with us. Greg is the director of St. George's in Valley Lee, Maryland. Uh, would you just tell us a little bit about yourself, Greg? Sure. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Great to hang out with you guys from afar. Um, so yeah, I'm, I serve as the rector of two churches in the Diocese of Washington. Um, as Jason said, St. George's in the little town of Valley Lee. Um, where I am at present, but also uh, Church of the Ascension in Lexington Park, which is about seven miles away. And um, frankly, I haven't even been in that building for like a week and a half now. And um, so trying to figure out what's going on over there. Um, we've, we were two separate parishes who um, have been on a journey together for 
probably about five years now, um, regionally, we've been exploring the idea of what does it mean to be like church in the community, and then also like dealing with just the significant challenges, frankly, of um, <laughs> running the small localized version of the Episcopal Church in blank town is a lot of work. And so, um, right, if, if you just look at the the manual of business affairs or whatever in the Episcopal Church, like you just imagine doing that for like, what was the average Episcopal Church in, in America today is like 53 people on a Sunday. Like, how do you pull that off? How do you, how do you pull off like all of that that needs to go into just running an effective, efficient business called the Episcopal Church? Um, so we've been like just wrestling that dragon. Well, at St. George's, we're good about slaying dragons. So, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you slay that dragon and create a more effective and frankly, more mission-minded and ministry curious business model for the Episcopal Church? And so what we've been doing is creating one parish with, with two campuses. Um, we have had some success. We're on we're on a glide path in the diocese of Washington. It takes the action of two um, conventions, uh, and so we we made our our first proposal at our convention this last January. And next January we'll celebrate and we'll become the newest parish in the diocese of Washington. So there's kind of that that journey, which has actually been really cool and creative. Um, and again, like I said, it's just it's just real conversations about like how do you create a business model that fosters uh, innovation or at least some level of like genuine curiosity around ministry and mission forward, mission focused kind of efforts, um, which ironically could put us in a unique place to to be having this conversation when everything went into great shutdown, mm -hmm. um, like because. Because I am technically the rector of two different congregations um, becoming one parish, we made a conscious decision in the last three years to say um, nothing will only be, nothing, most things will never be only at one place. So we do them in the name of both places, we do them in the name of the larger um, body. Um, so, but then how do you do like data storage? We, we may, you know, like so many congregations are struggling with just basic like uh, uh, internet infrastructure and Wi-Fi infrastructure. Like, so we, we had to wrestle that years ago. Like we needed to make sure that um, nothing was ever only stored at one building um, because, because church is Church is much more about what's beyond the four walls of the building um, and the intersections and the and the connection points between the buildings. Um, so yeah. we've leaned into a lot of um, stuff, and then just really leaning on the invite, welcome, connect resources that you know Mary Foster Farmer has put together, um, uh, and and then uh, that kind of kicked off that piece that I wrote for um, Vital Practices, which I think is a, is a cool, I mean, just Vital Practices, a shout out to them for the good work that they're doing to kind of keep us all connected. Um, early on in March, they, they sent a note to people who write for them regularly and said, hey, let's just make the shift now. Anything that you're learning on the ground now from like how to do church and shutdown, let's share it. And it's really been cool to see. Nice. Uh, different number of voices coming in on that platform too. That's cool. Well, that's exactly what we wanted to talk to you about is what you put in that article. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. So with, as you mentioned, you have a very mission forward set of congregations. So what has virtual invite and welcome look like in these new virtual spaces? How have you made that transition? Yeah, it's, it's um, part of it is we've learned after the fact, we pushed hard. I mean, we made, we made the, the change early from um, shutdown at the Diocese of Washington under Bishop Marianne's leadership. Um, I think it was March 11th. She said, we're closing down for um, two weeks. Uh, and of course, then that, that became until May 16th at, at the earliest. So we just made a, a very fast turn to um, virtual 
virtual worship in some way. Um, we opted for using Zoom, um, but I know that, you know, like going live on Facebook or, or streaming live on YouTube certainly also works for some other communities. Um, getting the word out though has been, it's actually been on the one hand easier. Um, we've, I've, I feel like I've connected much more with people who I would have said before all this, we're kind of on the margins of our communities. I feel like I've connected a lot more with those folks, both within the church congregations and frankly, within the neighborhoods, um, right? Because our churches are always situated within neighborhoods, but we're, we're so busy talking um, within the walls and talking among ourselves that we forget about our neighbors and neighborhoods. I feel like I've become vastly more connected with our neighbors and neighborhoods and communities and people who traditionally weren't like right in front of my face the whole time. Um, but then again, you know, then we had to kind of do a double take a couple weeks in with launching virtual platforms is like, how, how are we checking into those people that we used to regularly see and always interact with? And so um, we just really relied on um, the vestry and the lay leadership to then um, just honestly like pick up the phone. And so we just divided the list among vestry and key lay leaders and they divided the list and they're just calling through. On the one hand, it's calling through to just do the check-ins and say, we're here, we're praying for you, um, how are you? On the other hand, it's just a great reminder to like help people themselves make the shift because the power of a five minute phone call in, in helping some people um, know for the first, you know, like they didn't know. I was shocked by the amount of people who didn't know that um, church is still going on on Sunday mornings. Um, and number two, uh, to help them kind of make that shift so that they can get onto these virtual platforms. And, and also to be like, I'm frankly surprised by the, by the level uh, to which um, a lot of our uh, uh, really active aging folks have just been like been able to make the shift um, and, and catch on. So like the, you can just see like the average number of households tuned in um, has increased Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, even to the point where like Easter too, which is normally such a drop, right? From Easter, there wasn't a huge drop from people logged on on Easter to people logged on on the second Sunday after Easter. I'm curious. Oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, I was just going to say, we've heard that from a lot of communities, too, that um, their engagement has keep, keeps going up, that um, that Easter, too, wasn't near as a drop. Um, and that's really uh, lovely. And, you know, I'm curious how, as we uh, here in our state and some others are talking about going back, you know, how do we can continue that momentum? Um, I'm, I, I don't know that we have answers yet, but um, but I think that that's an important thing to notice. So. Yeah. I'm also curious about retention of, of people that are finding you right now. Yeah, how do you connect people with the congregation during this this crazy season, Greg? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, people do seem to have a lot more time now to pay attention to um, just just gathering, uh, even for opportunities for evening prayer. Or you know, just doing some like short uh, Facebook Live kind of updates with people. Um, uh, that that the question about connection ongoing that you hinted at, Stephanie. I know you, Jason, you're talking about now. I'm um, I'm also starting to really wonder like, what does happen when we go back? To, you know, I, um, I'm I'm parking the phrase new normal. I, I just, you know, I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> that phrase is already tired a couple weeks in. Um, but whatever's going to happen afterwards, that's, that's starting to really bother me right now in a way that, that is encouraging some like innovation, innovation and curiosity. Like, how are we going to go back and keep connected to people who we are suddenly now in a much deeper relationship with than, than I ever have been? Like, how can, what are they, what are they connecting with? What is feeding them? Um, and how can we make sure not to lose that, um, frankly, when all of our attention then goes back to, um, I mean, I hate to say it, but like the Sunday show. 
right? I mean, like, I just that that's a that's a question that's nagging at my at my mind and heart these days. It sounds like you're actually saying that our attention cannot fully go back uh, yeah. to what it what it was. That there needs to be some attention to what actually connected with people during this season, and how do we continue to re how do we retain those things? How do we keep those things moving? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to be a both and like, mm -hmm. because there are going to be vulnerable populations that we didn't weren't reaching before our shut ins and that kind of thing that have really appreciated like you mentioned people on the margins. Um, so how do we both stay connected to those and continue. Uh, I mean, people are craving Eucharist too. So mm -hmm. how do how do we do both. I, I don't know that I have answers but and this reminds those are me of oh, questions. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, this reminds me of. Um, a lot of conversations I've had with clergy over the past month or so about it's really great that you're doing so much and you're really stepping up in your virtual worship and offerings and everything like that, but be thinking about what you'll have capacity for. And it's so much harder to predict when we don't even know what we're going to be entering sort of slowly. We're not going to flip a switch and we go back to what it was, but what, what do we have capacity to do when we're balancing in-person Sunday stuff and in-person small groups with this new virtual offering that we've kind of been shoved into. Yeah. 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 Well, that was, I think that's, um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you, you started doing these hangouts like after Easter because, and I, I knew that, like, I just had this feeling like, okay, it was March, we were all shut down, everybody, like, I mean, I, you know, it's like, okay, just take the pill, you're shut down, and get over it, get on the other side as quickly as, like, you can, just, like, spiritually, psychologically, whatever, right, like, because we all knew, like, bummer, Easter's gonna kind of be different this year, well, frankly, at first, I was like, Easter's gonna suck this year, well, Easter didn't suck, right, but, like, we're really good on, like, pushing toward, Holy Week and Easter, and after Easter is always a letdown. But now it's like, okay, now we've we've got another like, wh whoever knows how many more weeks or months of this. So yeah, what is this going to look like? And um, for those of our colleagues in lay leadership and clergy leadership in the church, like, who just like poured themselves into like daily Facebook lives and daily morning prayer, and like, I mean. Most of your people were not that into church before the shutdown. Like, how, how do you think that you're going to have the capacity to, like, offer something um, winsome and spiritually fulfilling, like, every day for two months? So it's part of this is, like, how do we pace ourselves for a marathon? But also, how do we, like, slow down from our, like, in-your-face church all the time to, like, how do we create honestly, like ministry curiosity in our communities to be like, okay, so we've learned how redundant our buildings are over the over these weeks, right? Um, we've also learned how interesting human connection is over these weeks. Uh, we've learned how, how profound, um, like the heritage of our own Christian theological tradition is about Lent and Easter and what does new life look like when you don't experience new life? I mean, heck, they went like, they tried to go back to their fishing lives and, and, and yet Jesus still met them there. Um, but then like, how do we create some curiosity around what is happening in our neighborhoods? Um, uh, one, of, one of my churches, uh, Ascension in Lexington Park is um, is in a classic uh, mid 20th century post-war suburb. And we know what happened to all of those immediate, like those Levitt town post-war suburbs is um, suddenly now it's filled with people who um, have are, are dealing with real systemic justice issues. But it's a congregation that, um, and I don't I don't mean any fault, but it's a congregation that has excelled at like being merciful, but it hasn't excelled at justice. Um, it hasn't excelled at um, really wanting to know the deep um, plagues and brokenness in its neighborhood. In the last five weeks, it's a congregation that has really much more ingratiated itself and much more connected itself to its neighborhood through its food pantry and its justice ministries. Um, it, it, the other church, um, St. George's, is in a, a, a lovely but kind of distant part of the community, but we're also learning, like, 
our local school system, um, I had no idea, but, but uh, households, households with school age kids in St. Mary's County, um, there are 70% uh, of them do have access to internet, but it's still like 30% of households with school aged kids in our community do not have access to internet. So what's that gonna look like when we're allowed to go back into public gatherings? Um, we've got a building that's got you know, kitchen and classrooms and internet. Um, how could that building be a resource for this neighborhood um, mm -hmm. and, and these families, um, many of whom are trying to do distance learning, um, but they don't have access to some, some basic needs like internet um, or a place to be. Um, so that, that's actually got our vestry and lay leadership um, thinking along kind of more, more kind of like futuristic lines. I love that. That's a great question. I, I, I'm hoping that in, in future conversations, we can talk a little bit and more about that type of a, of a response, because I think that especially now that we're at, we're post Easter now in this season, but still functioning in this way, it is time to begin to think about some of those things to look outward and ask ourselves, how do we engage in our communities this way? I'm also, a lot of our response is colored by the fact that um, not everybody that's leading our efforts to be online are, are natives to the to the internet world. And yet, I'm, and so I'm wondering about how we look to to young people. Um, Stephanie, I think you were you were kind of thinking about this as well as someone that works with youth and young adults in formation. Yeah, I saw, and maybe this is a question for Ellie as much as Greg's as our resident Gen Zer on the call. Um, so, uh, you know, young adults, young people have been are, are digital natives to these um, to these platforms, and suddenly they're the experts um, where the boomers were not. Um, so, are there things that we can lean into that they've are, that you guys have already learned? How you find, or Greg, are you finding your your young adults? Being more active in this time, maybe I'm. I'm curious as what, how we're engaging the young people. I, I would I would be curious about about Ellie's experience. I know that our young adults and and um, just yeah anyone um, younger than the average age of the average Episcopalian has been really key in helping us like make this uh, virtual transition. I mean they've been like tech support um, to so many. Uh, people, um, but I, I gotta, I gotta admit, like our our tech game is nowhere near where it should be. Um, if we were to make a t transition this coming Sunday, um, we would drop a Zoom platform um, and go to I don't know what. And frankly, that that's kind of scary to me. I mean, that that bothers me in a way that I want to get on the other side of it. Yeah, I um, I sort of jokingly have the nickname diocesan grandkid because <laughs> I'm like traveling around virtually helping people progress, I guess, digitally. Um, and it looks different for every church based on where where your people are. That's the advice I always give is like, go to where people are going to find you. You don't have to like, you don't have to look like Buzzfeed right now and actually it's probably going to throw people off and you shouldn't do it right like find find your people um but as a young adult engaged in church this just feels completely natural like i have been watching people on youtube and having these kinds of video chat calls since i was in middle school um it kind of dawned on me yesterday that there might be this disconnect especially in like text-based chat things um but also over video about how real you might think the social interaction is. Like I find digital church and, and sort of like logging on to Compline, let's say, I find that to be almost probably 80% equivalent to church church, right? Um, and I know that's not true for some people maybe, but I think that we have, we've built in the past month or so a huge amount of infrastructure and energy around like realizing that those relationships are real um, and getting people connected to those relationships in new ways. And I don't wanna undercount that either. Like we definitely have 
a long ways to go in, in terms of technology, but the growth that we've seen over the past month, the number of people who have downloaded Facebook for the first time so that they can actually attend church and, and like the new and creative things that people are creating, all the videos that are coming out for the first time, I'm actually seeing things on YouTube, which is something I've been screaming about. Um, it's inspiring. It's inspiring. And we it really can take is. it slow now is the yeah. nice thing about that. Yeah. We've come far, yeah. we can take it slow. Yeah. yeah. We had a couple questions coming through from Facebook. Um, Amy was asking about virtual newcomer classes or newcomer hot coffee hours. And I know that there are some congregations that are doing things of that nature. So certainly look online. If you are doing that, if you're doing a newcomer's coffee hour or a virtual newcomer's class, share that. Uh, you might even want to put a comment in the feed for, for this post on Facebook so that people can find that and see what you're doing. The other question was about using members of the congregation to almost act as welcomers or greeters online services. I think this is a great idea. I don't know if, if you're doing anything like this, Greg, but I've thought it was a great idea to, to see some of our congregations having somebody almost like a moderator. So like right now, nobody here sees Liz Gutierrez, who's actually a part of this call because she's the one engaging on Facebook Live, watching what people are posting and then making sure those of us that are presenting information are aware of that so we can stay engaged with it. But that seems like a great idea to have someone kind of greeting people at the door when they show up in worship. Hey, Greg, glad you're here, you know, answering questions and such. Have you done anything like that, Greg, with your services online? We've been, we've, it feels like every week is a co completely different service. And so like, um, how many people does it take to run like a Zoom worship service? Um, the answer is more than I thought on Sunday number one. Um, <laughs> right now, right now we've got a team of like six and, um, and it's, it's actually become really super important um, because you've got, so like assigning co-host to a number of people so that they're able to mute and unmute people um, so that they're able to like chat privately with people um, so that they're able to monitor like Liz is doing, monitoring the live stream so that the questions are feeding into the, you know, um, there's a lot, there's a lot that's like going on. Corollary to that is like, um, we've been playing around with Sunday worship when we were in person worship and asking those questions of like, how <laughs> How many people do you need to run the average Episcopal worship service and what roles should they be doing? And so we started to like, um, at one of my churches, we never really had a strong choir. And so we discontinued the choir. And so we, we were working on this kind of like congregation as choir kind of thing. But then you're like, okay, well then how does that work? So then the music director and the traditional role of like choir and, and musician and that, um, if you don't have that anymore, you actually have to up your game because then you have to like encourage and create a kind of musical and music making culture in your community, um, which sounds all great until you realize that it doesn't work unless you have planted leadership in the community. So um, do you need a whole cadre of acolytes and, and liturgical ministers or should you maybe have a, a bare skeleton crew, um, have your readers not vested, but just come up and do the reading? Um, but then take advantage of saying that we don't need as many people. We don't need altar parties of like 15, but maybe if you have an altar party of three, you can take those 12 and like deploy them as greeters, connectors, ushers. That same, right? That's like, we were already on that journey in in-person worship. Um, now, like we, we've we realized over whatever, I, I forget how many Sundays we've been into virtual worship now, but like we started with a team of two. Now we're at a team of six running um, kind of Zoom church and um, and there's still more room for more people to help, uh, which I think is really key. Like it's about greeting, connecting um, to some degree, like ushers would hand you a bulletin. You need somebody to be on the front end. Um, yeah. That was the one thing that, that kicked off my thinking when I wrote that that first article for Vital Practices, which was, I heard back from some people like, you know how we get on Zoom and because Zoom has the feel of like a small group meeting, even though you can have up to a hundred or several hundred people, um, there's just the temptation to like make small chat before you begin, which can feel really good to some like, oh, hi, you know, 
and it can also be really um, of a turn off to others. Mm. Like, what did I just walk into? It could, it can almost have the same um, turn off feelings of, as to like walking into a church where everybody knows everybody, but mm. they don't know you. So I, I went back to, you know, Mary Foster Palmer's excellent question about, um, about uh, invite, which is, is, is your church a friendly community or is it a community of friends? And so we, we started that like, okay, what are we doing? Like in that first 15 minutes as people gather on, like, so we started to switch to like playing slides or just like playing a, you know, a Spotify playlist um, and uh, making sure that people are muted so that people don't feel like they're walking into a party to which they weren't invited. Mm. That's so smart. And it seems like you've done a good job of trying to look at gathering, not just in person, but now online through the lens of the visitor and, and the person that is un, un, uninitiated. And this seems so important. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for taking time to have this conversation with us. Uh, it's really good to see your face. Um, and we're, we're just grateful for your leadership in the church. Um, friends, for those of you that are checking in, next week we will be speaking with the Reverend Les Carpenter from St. Aidan's in Cypress, Texas. And we will be talking about how do we continue to nurture a community online uh, what are some emotionally intelligent ways to respond to what's going on right now? Um, and I think that's about it. Stephanie, you want to close us out? Um, yeah, we had, I think, one more question or more, more of a comment around being inspired to continue these practices long after COVID-19 is in the rear window. And I think, I think we are finding that these are important um, practices to continue.